it's now more years than I care to remember since I first started using inflatable boats. It was a little Avon Red Start, powered by a two horsepower Yamaha, and I have very fond memories of those days. One of my regular areas for exploration was Loch Craignish on the west coast of Scotland. Of course, I had to choose good weather days, so I travelled there the night before, slept in the car, then launched the boat in early morning light. I was very aware that there was a fierce tide race across the entrance of Loch Craignish, and it was called the Doris Moor, which roughly translates means the big door. The race headed straight across the Sound of Jura and ended or started at the Corrie Vrecken, which is the world's third largest whirlpool. As such, I kept well clear of the entrance of Loch Craignish, but sometimes crept down the eastern shore to Crannan, catching mackerel as I went. The truth is that back then I was afraid of tide races, and rightly so on a little inflatable with a two horsepower outboard. But I often wondered what it would be like riding the Doris Moor or going through the Corrie Vrecken in an inflatable boat. It was many years later that I found out, but being safe at sea is a long learning curve anyhow. Fast forward to the present day and myself and regular boating buddy Gordon decided on having a mini multi-day adventure during a two-day spell of good weather. And the plan was to ride the Doris Moor into Loch Craignish. And this is the story of how we got there. It was an 80 mile return trip, with two nights while camping near Easdale. And like all my adventures nowadays, it started at Kelly's Pier in Lochetif, simply because we can park trailers and cars at my house. Gordon and his two dog crew were in a red XL Valair 420 powered by a 20 horsepower four stroke. I was in the grey Garnard powered with a 25 horsepower two stroke. We were perfectly happy cruising along around 15 miles per hour under the warm blue sky, although there was a fresh breeze blowing in the wind. It was 2 o'clock in the afternoon and there was minimum wave on the surface of a sheltered sea loch. The tide was on the flood so a fair flow was coming under the Connell Bridge but as it was halfway between spring and eep tides, there was nothing to write home about. Unless you're in a little Avon Red Start, powered with a two horsepower outboard. Once under the bridge, it's then only a short hop, skip and splash to the furtive lawn in the open sea. There were a few waves about, but the four metre long boats kept easily in the plain, although Gordon did slow a little to save his dog crew being bounced out the boat. It was lovely seeing the Dunstaffnage coastline covered in vibrant green growth after the muted colours of winter weeds. To save shaking the dogs about too much, I decided to head into Oban Bay and continue south down the more sheltered waters of the Sound of Carrera. But first, we left plenty of room for the Calmac ferry to get out of the bay and on its way to Lismore. We 
landed in Little Horseshoe Bay on the island of Carrera for a late lunch and to let the dogs stretch their legs. Then it was back in the boats for another bouncy bit as we made our way to the island of Seal. an enjoyable journey. I just love feeling the wind blowing in my head where hair once grew and smelling the salt in the warm sea air. It's at times like this that I know I'm living my life to the full, even though I know at 65 years old my glass is less than half empty. I did learn long ago you only get out of life what you are willing to put into it, and I'm making sure that there's still a lot of adventures left in me yet even if it may kill me. Then, rounding the corner into the beautiful Easdale sound, I awoke from my philosophising dream and came back to reality. We had now arrived at our camping spot for the next couple of nights. Knowing our boats would be safe in the shelter of a long-forgotten harbour, built and abandoned many years ago for the slate industry. It didn't take long to pitch the tents, and as we scoffed supper and slurped some beer, the ebbing tide left our boats high and dry, safe for the night, and would be floating again in the morning. Suitably refreshed, relaxed, and half cut, we then passed time by having a walk to admire our surroundings. And what a stunning secret place it is! Then we headed back to camp, checked the boats, had a few more beers and then watched a glorious sunset before turning in for the evening. And day one was done. We woke the following morning to a lovely bright and windless day. Our boats were floating in the harbour waiting our return, and after a hearty breakfast we started outwards and headed back to sea to see what we could see. a few miles before deciding to land on the island of Belnahua to let the dogs wander around the abandoned village where almost 200 people once lived and worked mining and cutting the slate 
that still covers the roofs of many UK houses. It's a favourite stop off of mine, and as I wander among the ruins of houses, stores, school and workshops, I often imagine hearing the voices of men and women working or children playing here in the early 1900s. Much of the machinery and many of the tools used for processing a slate still lie as they were left when everyone left the island, to rust and decay in silence broken only by the squawk of seabirds. The slate pits now flooded are home for Black Gullimut. Life was not easy here as there was no fresh water supply and supplies had to be shipped across fast flowing tides even in winter storms. In 1914 when World War I started the men left to become soldiers and fight in the war. The women and children left then too and no one returned. The island is now an unofficial museum to times gone by. We left Belnahua and its present day seabird community in peace, while we headed south towards the sound of Jura. Passing a narrow gap between the islands of Lunga and Scarba, I could clearly see a white wall of water, proving the tide race known as the Grey Dogs was in full fettle. I headed across to have a closer look. Unfortunately, the wide angle of the GoPro does not show the six foot standing waves to a true height. One look convinced me that I would need a bigger boat than I had to run that race when the waves were there. Gordon too took a look and decides it best for another time. headed diagonally across the sound of Jura towards the distance entrance of Loch Craignish. On a calm day the whole sound of Jura can be seen flowing like a wide river. On the right hand side we passed the entrance to the mighty Corrie Vrecken, but we had no desire to have a look in there on this particular day. On the left hand side the rocky reefs of Risame Padir reflected in the calm waters of the sound. The more forceful flow of the Doris Moor was now evident as we came closer to the mouth of Gloch Craignish. Huge hydraulic boils and small whirlpools started to appear where eddy lines rubbed together. I was glad I was not in the old Dave and Red start with its two horsepower outboard. Doris Moor was no match for the Grey Gurner's 25 horsepower outboard, and soon we were motoring along Loch Craignish, where we landed for some lunch and to let the dogs have a leg stretch. And soon it was time to return to camp, but this time we went up the sound of Shuna 
and through the cue and sound. We spent the rest of the day relaxing and lazing around the tents before going to bed as the sun set. The following day was forecast to be rain and sure enough we awoke to a grey day so packed everything away and headed back to Tinault. Another great adventure was over. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.